Well, right now, I am at Spangler Spring at the base of Culp's Hill. And if you come to Gettysburg, one thing that you are going to see a lot of are monuments. Like this one right here to the Second Massachusetts. Uh, this was the very first regimental monument to go up here at Gettysburg. The men who, who charged across this field, if you watched the, the video that I did uh, entitled Murder at Spangler Spring, well you saw the story of the Second Massachusetts and their leader Colonel Mudge who charged across this field on the third day of the battle and absolutely got slaughtered. Well, we're at the base of Culp's Hill here at Spangler Spring. This is an area of Gettysburg that I think doesn't get enough attention. So, today, we're going to go up onto Culp's Hill. We're gonna look at some of the monuments up there and uh, tell a few of the stories of the regiments who fought right here on July 2nd and 3rd of 1863. Well, here we are looking at, to me, one of the more fascinating figures from the Battle of Gettysburg, and that is General George Sears Green. And you might be looking at this and wondering why is it that General Green has his back to us? Well, if you come around to this side, you can see that, that Green is facing the enemy and he's pointing at the Confederates who are ascending the slopes of Culp's Hill. Uh, Green, I think, could very well be called the savior of Culp's Hill and uh, really did a lot to uh, protect the, the Union right flank during the Battle of Gettysburg. So whenever the 12th Corps was ordered to reinforce uh, the, the Union left during the, the Sickles debacle, or maybe more their center, um, Green was left alone on Culp's Hill with just a single brigade uh, that was made up of five different New York regiments. There was the 60th, the 78th, the 102nd, uh, the 137th, my personal favorite, and the 149th. So his line was stretched super thin and uh, he had a civil engineering background. He's the one who ordered his men to start digging in and erecting breastworks. And it was probably that action that kept the Confederates from, from breaking through uh, on, on July 2nd and July 3rd. Uh, as a compliment and as a testament to his leadership, uh, Longstreet later said that Green, um, uh, or I'm sorry, he said of Green that there was no better officer in, in either army. So yeah, there's old, there's old Pap Green, one of the oldest commanders in the Civil War. I think he was 61 whenever the Civil War started. Pretty fascinating guy. Now, here is a monument that is interesting for a couple of different reasons. Uh, this says it's to the 2nd Maryland Infantry Confederate States of America. So this is a Confederate monument. Uh, here's the deal though, it's not the 2nd Maryland. It's actually the 1st Maryland. But the story is, is that whenever this monument was planned to go up, uh, Union veterans protested, not because it was a Confederate monument, but because there was a 1st Maryland on the Union side and they didn't want there to be any confusion. So the 1st Maryland Confederates reluctantly agreed to have their name changed for the monument. So if you go here close, you can see it says 1st Maryland changed to 2nd Second, Second Maryland Infantry, Confederate States of America. Here's the tragic story of this particular group is they ended up getting tangled with another Maryland group on the Union side right here in this area and uh, just thrashed the heck out of each other. Uh, as a matter of fact, the color bearers on either side were cousins and were, so you, you literally have family members fighting against one another and they had a, a, a mascot, a little dog named Grace that was killed in the advance on July 3rd 
and uh, there was a general on the Union side that said that she was the only Christian-minded being on either side. Well, the area that I am in right now is kind of in the, the saddle between Upper Culps Hill and Lower Culps Hill. As I mentioned in a, an earlier video, uh, Culps Hill is not really just one hill. It's kind of like Big Round Top and Little Round Top. Uh, there's an Upper Culps Hill and a Lower Culps Hill. And this area doesn't get a whole lot of attention, not nearly as much as the southern end of the battlefield, mainly because if you watch the movie Gettysburg, like you wouldn't even really know that Culps Hill was even part of the battle. And if you come to this area, there are just monuments everywhere. And I'll, I'll admit, the first time that I came to Gettysburg and saw all of these monuments on Culps Hill, I thought, what in the ever-loving heck is all of this? But the more that I've learned, uh, the more I've come to appreciate it, uh, not only for the historical information that it has provided and helping me to understand the battlefield, uh, but also some of the uh, artistic expression in these monuments. Well, here's a monument that should look familiar. This is a monument to the 137th New York Infantry, and this is one of my favorite regiments here at Gettysburg. Uh, in the video entitled The Forgotten Heroes of Gettysburg, we talked about uh, their, their commander, David Ireland, and how they basically uh, have a story that almost is identical to that of the 20th Maine on the other end of the battlefield, but they don't get near the credit. So anyway, I'm not going to go into too much depth here on the 137th. Uh, but if you look off here, whoops, I'm about ready to fall. Uh, if you look off here to the right, well, in that other video, I talked about how the big story of Culp's Hill is that of earthworks. Now these earthworks, you can kind of see these trench areas here. These were reconstructed during the uh, Great Depression by the Central, or, or I'm sorry, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and what they didn't reconstruct is something that is very important to Culp's Hill, and that was something called a traverse. So the line would have come all the way down Culp's Hill here, and right around in this area, it would have hit a 90 degree angle and taken a sharp right and went across this road. And this was to deny the Confederates their right flank. So whenever you're studying Culp's Hill, uh, you'll, you'll read a lot about, about the traverse. It was a, a pretty important marker here. And we are starting to get rained on a little bit. Now here's a monument that frankly is, is kind of plain. Uh, it goes to the 14th Brooklyn Infantry. And uh, to me what makes it kind of cool is we have a little bit of extra information. Up here it says dedicated AD 1890. And the rain is now picking up. Oh my dear heavens. Okay, well, as you can see, and maybe here, we are getting some uh, some rain. We got a, a little bit of a moisture situation going on here. Uh, so I may have to suspend looking at the monuments of Culp's Hill here, but yeah, I probably need to get in out of the rain because camera equipment and water don't mix well. All right, well, we have ourselves uh, a little bit of a history traveler rain delay, which, which is okay because we, we still have things that we can be doing at least until the, the weather breaks and gets a little bit better. So Skillshare uh, partnered up with us on this video. And uh, if you are unaware of who Skillshare is, this is an online learning community that has literally thousands of different classes for people who are looking to either acquire new skills or, or kind of deepen the skills that they already have. They cover a, a wide range of topics from photography to video, business, marketing, all, all kinds of different things. So even if it's raining outside, uh, well, that doesn't mean that the learning has to stop. 
So for me personally, right now, I'm trying to kind of sharpen my own personal business skills. So the class that I've been working on right now is called The Art of the Start by Guy Kowalski, who's the chief evangelist for a company called Canva. And man, there's just been all kinds of uh, rich, interesting pieces of advice and information uh, that, that have really made me think. Things like, you know, not being worried about if something isn't perfect, uh, just go for it and work things out on the way. All right, so you all know me, you know that I'm, I'm passionate about learning. Uh, Skillshare is a platform that is geared specifically for learning, so there's not going to be uh, any annoying distractions or, or anything like that, and they're always launching new uh, premium classes. So they've offered a special deal where the first 1,000 subscribers that click the link in the description are going to get a free trial to the premium membership. So definitely check that out. I'm going to keep watching some of these classes. Uh, we're going to wait for this rain to subside and then uh, get out and get back after it. All right, well, uh, the rain delay is over. The uh, weather report said that it was supposed to be raining for the rest of the day, but uh, Kind of weird, it turned out to be wrong. I never have known the weather to be wrong, but in this case, I'm glad it was. And now we're, we're picking up where we left off here on Culp's Hill, starting back up with the big man of the 12th Corps himself, uh, General John Geary. And whenever I say big man, uh, literally, this guy was huge. All right, well, here is the monument to General John Geary, and uh, whenever I said that, that he was the big man, he stood almost six foot six inches tall, which was a giant in the 1860s. I think he weighed like around 260 pounds. So, so this was a man with, with presence. And uh, he commanded the second division of the 12th Corps under General Slocum. This guy was wounded six times over the course of the Civil War. So obviously a guy who, uh, who led from the front. Uh, he ended up becoming the governor of Kansas and I believe the governor of Pennsylvania after the war. And uh, something else that's really cool about him is whenever the Civil War cranked up, uh, he organized the 28th Pennsylvania Regiment and paid for all of their uniforms and equipment himself. So, so this, guy, this guy knew about leadership. Here's a, another one on Culp's Hill that I like, just because it starts getting into some of the art and symbolism in these monuments. This is a monument to the 67th New York Infantry. Uh, they were better known as the, the Brooklyn Phalanx, and uh, they helped drive the Confederates off of Culp's Hill uh, on July 3rd. So if we move up here, this bronze plaque is entitled it is over. And uh, you can see some of the, the symbolism there. You have a soldier who is standing at parade rest in honor of the fallen. Uh, if you look at his rifle, it is positioned in reverse arms, so not, not at the ready, so he's at rest. And if you look around his feet, well, you can see the detritus of war. There's a broken drum, broken stock of a rifle. Here's a knapsack that is strewn about. Yeah, pretty amazing. One other quick thing that I, I want to mention, I'm, I'm walking along the Union Breastworks right here, and if you look behind me, well, you can see where the Park Service has, has gone in and done a lot of work here on Culp's Hill to open up the woods to make it look more like it would have in 1863. 1863, there would have been a lot of farm animals roaming around, these woods would have been more open. And uh, before, this would have been just kind of like a, a green screen uh, that you couldn't really see through. But, but now, uh, thanks to the work that they've done here, uh, well, it, it makes it a, a little bit more of an authentic experience. So yeah, I, I like that. Now, this is another one of the monuments that I really like. Uh, this is the 149th New York Infantry Monument. This is a, another regiment that would have been in George Green's uh, brigade. But uh, anyway, if you, if you move up here and look at the plaque, well, this plaque is telling us a story. Uh, you can see Union soldiers there along the breastworks, and, and the title 
is mending the flag under fire. This depicts the fighting that occurred on July the 3rd. Uh, the regimental flag of the 149th, when the fighting was over, had over 80 bullet holes in it. And uh, the shaft had been shot into two pieces. Well, there was one Confederate who tried to capture this flag and was shot five times, fell within two feet of getting it. So that, that would have occurred right around here in this area. Well, what we're looking at here on this plaque is a depiction of uh, a guy by the name of Sergeant Lilly who while under fire repaired the damaged shaft that you see right here and uh, used slats from a, a cracker box and straps from his knapsack to mend it together and was slightly wounded in the process. This is something that, that meant a lot to the men who fought here and was something that, that they all remembered. All right, uh, well, if you will excuse me for just a minute, uh, I've decided to take uh, a little bit of a detour off of the main path because whenever you're at Culp's Hill, you see everything from the Union position and from the breastworks. And looking down in the woods, I couldn't help it. I wanted to get down here and see what the view would be like from the Confederate position. All right, so just to give you a little bit of reference uh, the the little swag that I'm looking at right there uh, that that is the saddle between upper Culps Hill and lower Culps Hill uh, the 137th infantry regiment monument is right in here so so this is the view that Confederates under the command of General Johnson would have had whenever they were trying to take Culps Hill and dad gum I can't even imagine not only going uphill, but uphill against a highly, highly fortified position. By the way, in the July heat, um, wearing those wool uniforms, that, that must have just been awful. And uh, there were wave after wave of Confederates that attacked that position. They got close a few times, but... Uh, yeah, old George Green having his men dig in probably saved Culp's Hill. Hey, so uh, here's something else that I just noticed. If you are the Confederates and you are attacking this Union position uphill, fortified, look what else you're doing. If you're going in the evening, you're attacking right into the sun. Yeah, so this, this is going to be a tough one all around for the Confederates. While I'm making my way up to the top of Culp's Hill to uh, look at the, the final set of monuments that I'm wanting to show, I, I do want to give a special thanks to a gentleman by the name of Dave Collins who came out here with me and, and showed me a lot of the things on these monuments. I filmed it, but unfortunately, uh, through a mistake that was completely mine, uh, the audio got messed up and, and rendered the footage unusable. But uh, anyway, Dave, if you're watching this, thank, thank you so much for uh, lending your time to, to helping me Learn a little bit more about Culp's Hill. Now, of all of the monuments here on Culp's Hill, this is one of my favorites. This is a monument to the 102nd and 78th New York Infantry who fought here on July 2nd and 3rd and were part of Green's Brigade. And uh, as you can see, they've integrated the earthworks, breastworks, into this monument like so many of the monuments here on Culp's Hill have done. Uh, and what I really like, this is something that Dave showed me. If you look carefully, well, there are some layers to this one. 
Uh, you can see right in here is a lion's head and then you can see a paw right there below the fence rail to uh, indicate the, the bravery of the men of the 78th and 102nd. Now you might be asking yourself why is this a combined monument? Why are there two regiments on this one? Well, these two regiments ended up getting combined into one in the summer of 1864. But yeah, this one right here is one of my favorite and to me one of the most artistic monuments here on Culp's Hill. So again, we're looking at another one of my favorite monuments up here on Culp's Hill. Uh, this one to the 1st Regiment Eastern Shore of the Maryland Volunteer Infantry. And here we see a soldier in the prone position at the ready behind the, the breastworks that, that everybody knew Culp's Hill for and, and remembered here at the battle. So you kind of get the perspective on this one of being alongside him and looking down in uh, in the valley there as Johnson's Confederates were were advancing um, this this kind of tells a a tragic story here uh, so again we, we looked at the Confederate monument to the Marylanders earlier uh, this is the other one so there would have been some positioned here on the left and then about 300 yards to the right uh, down at, uh, at Lower Culp's Hill, there would have been a detachment from this regiment and uh, that's where those guys would have, would have gone after each other. And, and that is kind of talked about here on the other side. So you have to look at the all sides of these monuments. So there on the right it says, well, it says five companies held the works in front of this stone on the morning of July 3rd, uh, relieving other troops and remaining until about noon when they were relieved. It says the remainder of the regiment were in position during uh, the same time, about 300 yards to the right. So, so these are, are helping to, to tell a story and to, to give us the history of what happened here. All right, well those were just a few of the monuments here on Culp's Hill. And there were so many that I didn't even get into, like for example, the uh, 150th New York. But, but there are so many stories from so many men who belong to all of these regiments along Culp's Hill. And like I said earlier, this is a part of the battlefield that doesn't get the attention that it really deserves. But the men who held these lines on the Union side uh, very well could have saved the Army of the Potomac from, from the brave men who were attacking from below. Um, definitely, definitely a, a key part of the battle that happened here that, that deserves recognition and deserves attention. So if you ever come to the Battle of Gettysburg, don't forget this place.